we'll do this talk together with Bill McGlollan, whose voice is always perfection. Please help me welcome Bill McGlollan. You're back from the dead. You're back from the dead. I am back from the dead. Everybody thought that I was not going to be back, myself included, but my doctor is a genius and we get to do this again. Yeah. Unfortunately, bittersweet for the final time in 22, but I think it's fair to say we'll do this again somewhere. And um, we enjoyed this week very much uh, working together and oh, presenting yeah. this. Been big fun. So, I got a couple of notes in case I had to. <clears throat> Today we're gonna talk about the final two years of Beethoven's life. They were, without any kind of uh, sugar coating, quite tragic because throughout his life, he did have incredible physical problems. And those problems, of course, everybody knows about his gradual deafness. In this year, of course, he's fully deaf. But if you look at that first quote from a servant, you can see that he was still incredibly active as a composer and incredibly brash as a human being. He was mean to everybody. And um, fortunately, his creativity was the exact opposite of his demeanor as a human being. That said, he was also taking care of his nephew, which we'll get to in a moment. And in some ways, his relationship with his nephew, Carl, was kind of like a father-son relationship. Even though he had never married, he bade him and never married. And he really felt like his father figure uh, was, was not, not nice, right? I mean, we talked about in the previous concert talks how his father was an alcoholic, spent money, didn't take care of Beethoven, and in some ways, Beethoven wanted to be the opposite father figure to his nephew, Carl. Um, what, one of the things that was interesting in uh, doing research for this concert, as well as the entire week, is the business of music, which didn't really, the term, didn't exist, um, certainly until my second, third year in college. And the business of music is this slide right over here. Ferdinand Ries, who was... Beethoven's composed, um, sorry, student and kind of a champion of his works had at this point moved from Germany to London. But one of the things that he did was promote the music of his teacher, Ludwig von Beethoven. And it's amazing for us to kind of imagine um, that Beethoven, of course, everyone knew who he was, but Beethoven had to ask people in other countries to premiere his music. So Ries, for example, would go to the presenters in London and say, you know, there's this new symphony that was premiered a couple of years ago called the Choral Symphony by Beethoven. You should present. And he actually was successful in getting many performances in London as sort of an agent for Beethoven. And that made Beethoven feel really, really good. So we should talk a little bit more about the music because the, this, oh, yeah, sorry. This is a really important quote by Richard Wagner. And I want to talk to you about that because Richard Wagner, we all know, is one of the greatest 19th century opera composers, but did not write a single string quartet. He really did not write any chamber music, and he didn't write concertos. He devoted his whole life to opera. But look at what he says about the opening of the Opus 131 in this incredible melancholy, how it's expressed. It's an, I think it's an incredible testament to someone whose respect for Beethoven was boundless and still his compositional respect was in a completely different way. These are some of the reactions from the greats. You have Franz Schubert up there, and he basically, this is after he first heard the Opus 131, and then Robert Schumann, about 50 years later, he sp spoke basically as, as someone who was pianist first, right, and string player later. You know, what is there left to do? How can this be so extraordinary? Now, if you look at what he says about which no words can express, Beethoven was very famous in saying music is much more expressive than words when it comes to expressing feelings, emotions, and where we are in life. So let's take a look at the 131. It's in seven movements. It is the most movements Beethoven ever wrote. Um, it's played without any break, which is kind of amazing, Bill. Why would you do something like that? Keep people from going home. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> excellent point. But actually, yeah, there's a couple of the movements are extremely short. They sort of uh, bridge between one movement and the next, which makes sense. But this idea of 
We sort of think that as, since Haydn pretty much invented the quartet around 1760 when he was at the Esterhazy estate, and then along comes uh, Mozart, who was about 25 years younger than Haydn, and the two of them put a stamp on it, and all the quartets around that time were all four movements long. It was usually a first movement in something called Sonata Allegro form. It was usually kind of lively. It was most often a second movement, which was slow, and then a dance movement of some kind, most often a minuet. By the time Beethoven comes around, he says, uh, I need a little more energy. So the minuet turns into a scherzo, which is still in three quarter time, but much faster. Then there's a finale, which is again, usually fast. But as Beethoven goes along, he starts playing with the form in a way that reminds me, Mahler did the same thing with his symphony. The symphony has four movements in the same way that a string quartet had four movements. Until Mahler comes along and some of the others, and all of a sudden you get to the sixth and seventh and third symphony, why not add an extra movement? It could be more interesting and it could have a more profound effect on the audience. Another thing we should talk about is the way Beethoven worked. This quartet has over 200 pages of sketches. Wow. Yeah, and I, I, I know that Bill, as a wonderful composer, I'm sure you have sketches for all kinds of things, but 200 sketches for one piece of music sounds like a lot. Actually, it's more than 200, it's 200 pages of, of sketches. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's phenomenal. He would stew over things for years. When you look at the, the big two, da 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 we think that must have come to him like on a, on a wing of prayer, right? He got that tune right away. He didn't. There's a uh, piano piece, the Choral Fantasy, which comes it's almost the same tune, but not quite as good. And then years later, he kept working on that tune until it finally got to the shape that we know. All I mentioned, Werd and Bruden. But he didn't even find it right away. He was a hard, hard worker and never satisfied with his own work enough. So before we listen to some music, which is why we're all here, I want to tell you about the dedicatee, the Baron Joseph von Stutterheim. And he was an army uh, colonel, if I'm not mistaken. And one of the reasons that Beethoven dedicated this 131, which was actually his favorite quartet, according to him, to the Baron is because the Baron helped him out with his nephew, Carl. So Beethoven's nephew, Carl, was a troubled child who grew up to be a tri troubled adult. Um, this may sound kind of macabre and funny, but he attempted suicide twice with a gun and survived both. <laughs> so he wasn't a very good shot. He was not a very good shot. <laughs> Based upon that, the Baron immediately took him to the army to make sure that he could be a better yeah, shot. Yeah, but the kid got to load him up with duds. <laughs> Obviously. So um, Beethoven unfortunately died before the premiere of the quartet, but it's something that is, he was so gratified that Carl would be in disciplined hands in the army with the Baron kind of taking care of him, that he would dedicated this 131 to the Baron. So let's please, please listen to the first movement, our very first opening is a poignant fugue, and if you remember from our pre-concert talks, the fugues are, it's imitative counterpoint, where there's a certain rule about how you state the opening, counter subject, all kinds of things. In this case, it's so slow that it's almost difficult to keep track of the structure of it. We're kind of just sort of following the line as each instrument comes in. Let's hear number one, please. There's a lot of controversy about why this music seems to be pastoral and yet so incredibly colossal in structure. 
Well, for one thing, it's interesting because Beethoven didn't write a dynamic marking. He didn't tell the first violinist how loud to play his first phrase. By the time the second violinist comes in four measures later, he does write pianissimo. It almost seems like what we heard today was good. You barely hear the first entrance. It's as if the music has been going on forever. And someone has just opened a door, and now we can hear it. You know, um, J.W.N. Sullivan, his, I would say, his most important biographer, Beethoven's, said this was the most superhuman piece of music that Beethoven ever wrote. And superhuman, I think, is a very interesting term because it sort of transcends the human condition. I think it's all about the future and how Beethoven sees music affecting future generations. Let's look at the second movement, which is a folk dance, exactly the opposite of a fugue. It's sort of a rustic dance, um, but it's in 6-8 it, time. It lets the light in. After, after this somber first movement, which goes on and on, the tempo never picks up that from that slow fugue. Then the next movement is, is it's a country dance, and it's up a half step from C sharp minor to D major, just really letting the sun shine in. Now, if, if Beethoven was Italian, it would be a tarantella. But in this, it's, a, it's just a, a very country, folksy dance. Let's hear number two, please. This is exactly the opposite of the philosophy one gets in the fugue. But I still think that there is a sort of poignant sadness to it, even though it's a dance, because of the register where all the instruments play. The instruments, you'll see in this quartet, many of the instruments, many of the movements, in fact, are very close in range. So the first violin is very low on the instrument, but the cello and the viola are relatively high, so they're really compressed almost a symphonic kind of a germ um, for the range that Beethoven uses. Now, in the third movement, as Bill alluded to, it is a minuscule movement. In fact, our example, which is about 30 seconds long, mm -hmm. is about 80% of the movement. Mm -hmm. So let's hear that. It's operatic in a way, it's a recitative, which is something that somebody composed in an opera would use the professor, come before the scene where the soprano is going to, you know, or the whole chorus is going to say, but it's sort of like, it sets up, the telling this story, and the first violin is brilliant here, and the kid playing with the uh, Miro Quartet, isn't that a fantastic first violinist? He keeps knocking me out. They all knock me out, but this is particularly, the, the, he plays this quick, silver, fast stuff, and you hear every note so clearly. This cadenza, especially for me, is so exciting because it kind of straddles the stratosphere between Puccini and Verdi. Yeah. So it just seems to be looking ahead and yet paying homage to Italian opera, which of course was just rage in Germany. Um, let's look at the fourth movement. And the fourth movement is a set of seven variations. We're going to listen to three of them. This first one is the playfulness between violin one and cello. Now, those of you who have been here before for the Peter Concert Talks, you heard me speak about how the cello evolved during the early to middle period Beethoven. Well, here, because, by the way, some of his commissioners play cello, this is a full evolution of Beethoven really telling you the cello is an equal instrument, not just in a string quartet, but really everywhere as a solo instrument and a chamber music instrument. Let's hear the next one, please. Actually, can I say one thing just before oh, sorry. we go? Listen to the dialogue. You know what this reminds me of? You're sitting in a living room with some old friends, older than you, they're, they're your parents' friends, they, and this couple, married couple, have been married for a million years. And when they talk, one finishes the other sentence without any kind of 
It's just natural. He knows what she's going to finish up with, and he takes her, and then she keeps it. That's the way it goes back and forth between these two. Listen, it's really charming family music making, if you think of it in that way. Let's hear that next example, please. That's where the kids come in and they all want to have their own line too. As someone who is not married, he's very good at this, right? <laughs> so the next variation is all about compound meters. So what does that mean? This is written in 6-8, which is generally, if it was conducted, it'd be conducted into. So one, two, three, four, five, six. But every even bar is in three. So one, two, three, four, five, six, followed by one and two and three end. So you still have a total of six but he plays with it, and to make matters more complicated, some of the eighth notes are actually tied over. So we were talking about that in the Opus 59 quartets. Let's hear that example, please. last pizzicato I want to draw your attention to because these are gentle plucks, right? But Beethoven would not be Beethoven if he stayed gentle for very long. So you, he has to surprise you with something. Last variation um, is incredibly interesting. Bill, maybe you could talk about it after we listen because Beethoven puts in pauses, really rests in the music. And he wouldn't have to because we all know he wrote wonderful melodies, long, well, look at the opening of the quartet. It's a super long line, and yet this one has interruption after interruption after interruption. Let's hear that example, please. So he starts with what we had in the very short movement, in the third movement, and he has a big run, and then just at the what we, we think would be the end of the phrase, he gives a bar, what's called a grand pause, and then another grand pause. Why did he do that? It's as if he's gathering his thoughts. That's what, that's what I think, and he's, he's sort of like letting us think with him. Those spaces in between, we've just heard the phrase, and it's not like there's no sound going on. It's still in our ear. What well, we just heard, da -dee -da -dum, dead sounds, but you hear what I just sang. And I think that he's playing with that quite intentionally and very beautifully. It's also possible, you know, a lot of these quartets, not necessarily 131, but the earlier work premiered in relatively large rooms for that time. And so I'm wondering maybe one of the large halls that sat maybe 200 people, like this room, for example, a private home, would be a relatively large room. So I wonder if acoustically, because the ceilings were very high, there was a lot of echo that continued through, and Beethoven, looking ahead already, would know that you have to wait for the sound to dissipate until you go with the next one. So it's very exciting the way he scores this thing. All right, the fifth movement is a charming scherzo with wild pizzicato. Um, and there's a very famous passage, which is called Ponticello, which I'll talk to you about. I think if you look at this violin, which is 
um, kind of a transverse version of the violin. Basically, if you look at the fingerboard, it's much shorter than the violins that we are used to. And the bridge, though it's in the same place, looks like it's further away. So the Ponticello passage we're trying to draw your attention to, that we don't have an example of, would be very close to the bridge. And the reason the sound is sort of glassy and has a, a metallic sound, would you agree? It's sort of a yeah. metallic sound. You violinists have so many ways of changing the sound. That's one of the reasons I love to hear string players because they utilize all those colors. If you play over the fingerboard, you get a kind of, not muffled sound, but a very mellow sound. That's called sul tasto, which means the fingerboard. Sul ponticello, you can imagine that's a word which means bridge. You're right on the bridge. Now if you, get, if you play hard right when you're playing sul ponticello, you get a glassy sound. The people who started to write film scores in the 20s and 30s for monster movies loved ponticello. It's like, eh, 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 eh. you know? It's like that. But when Beethoven's doing it, he's not making it very loud, but he wants that color. It's that kind of icy color, as opposed to the softer soltasto. Yeah, it's almost ghostly. And one of the things that, that you should see when you look at the violin, the tailpiece at the very, very bottom is actually made of bone, and the, the nut at the top is made of um, bone as well. So it would keep the pressure and the ability to play at the bridge in the same place. Now, the tailpiece itself is actually made of apple wood, which was the way to do it. Now we have you know, titanium, we have all kinds of cool things we do with tailpieces. But back in the day, Beethoven would have known that the kind of sound he wants would be done there. And even though we have Ponticello all the way back from Mozart, I think in some ways, if you look at the right there, this technique was kind of invented by Beethoven because it, the passage, when you hear it with a quartet, is a very quick, fleeting pa passage, kind of like a Midsummer Night's Dream scared so. So he asks the musicians to play right at the bridge, sul ponticello, and then at the end of that passage, normale, means go back to playing between the bridge and the fingerboard. So the sound changes completely, and that ghostly sound um, becomes normal again, if you will. Um, I think. There are, some, there are some theories that that metallic sound was what little Beethoven could hear because he's now stone deaf. When he was conducting, he could not hear the orchestra. But certain musicians, for example, we talked about Smetna and Janacek, even when they couldn't hear things, they could hear certain frequencies that were very high. And Janacek in... in uh, yeah, poor Janacek got stuck. He kept hearing a very high E. Here's middle C on the piano, go up an octave, go up to the soprano high C, and then the E above that. It's really up there, and that he heard that sound in his ear all day long and all night long. Ouch. I remember seeing a, a film by Werner Herzog. I, I fell in love with Herzog. He's completely mad, and a couple of times I met him in Minneapolis. I won't tell you, but we were actually smoking a joint out back <laughs> with Werner Herzog. <laughs> it was my wild youth. And, but it was fun, because he was so interesting character. and. Uh, but when he wrote, the, he made this film about people who are born deaf and blind, and what it is it takes for them to connect with the rest of us and us to connect with them. And that's when I realized, if you're deaf, it's not silent. In fact, there's probably a lot of racket going on in your head. You just can't differentiate, and you can't hear the beautiful sound of your lover or of the music. That doesn't make it through all the racket. Absolutely. Let's listen to the prayer that we had before. This is a sixth example which is marked not too slow, very interesting. We'll talk about that after this example. John, next one, please. So he's using the darker color of the viola rather than the first violin to play that tune. So in some ways, this piece has two movements that so moved Wagner and Stra um, Schumann, sorry, and Schubert. Um, I want to talk about the marking of Poco Andante. If you think about it as a composer, 
why say poco andante, which technically is actually faster than adagio, which is at ease? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Beethoven was always fussing with his directions when he gave the players. Never, it, it never enough for him to say, play this fast, or play this slow, or play this soft, or play this loud. He always had more instructions. He was very specific about what he hoped to hear. And the interesting thing was, he actually couldn't hear it, so he had to imagine it. And so that makes him even more insistent that you play what he heard in his head. I have a feeling, too, it's maybe a little bit technical. If you look at the Baroque bow, the transverse bow right there, <clears throat> it's not designed to sustain. So if you wanted to play really, really slowly, you'd be losing a lot of tone at the tip because the tip is very, very light. And perhaps he says, don't worry about it. As long as the feeling is of a long line, we're good. So that's my theory. I'm going to stick to it. All right, the last movement is a muscular movement, very reminiscent, kind of a Nordic dance. And I was Shocking the way it starts. It's, 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 in the, it's shocking, and it's also, for me, it's like this close to Sibelius. <laughs> who died in the 20th century. Let's hear that, please. <laughs> He's writing that in the Napoleonic era, and he and Schubert seem to look past our own time, past their own time, past the 1820s. They look to the kind of trench warfare that came in the First World War and the Second World War. It's almost like you see over the horizon. And this, it's a nice thing to imagine the lads in their natty uniforms going off to war, and you know, there are big parades and people playing, and, but they're going to get off to get slaughtered. And that's what war is all about. And I think it's what I hear in this music, there's a ferocity to it that's really almost frightening. Yeah, after a while, you're going to wear down, but you're going to kill each other first. And also, really, from the Eroica Symphony, from the Third Symphony on, Beethoven constantly lamented the senseless death of people for emperors, which is one of the reasons he removed the dedication from Napoleon. Let's look at the 135, which is the final, the very okay, last one. Getting one more thing. You were quoting Wagner early, and I found this great I, I did a bunch of stuff for Emory University. We were supposed to be, I was supposed to go down there to Atlanta to do it, but it was the beginning of COVID. You couldn't get onto their campus. I mean, they weren't allowing anybody in from the outside, so I wound up doing a bunch of video presentations. And I'm a radio guy. I hate pictures. I mean, I hate having to, I mean, this is as formal as I get anymore. When I was a kid, <laughs> as a conductor, I had to wear a white tie and stuff, but... Anyway, I did these, these videos, and these are the notes I got. Here's Wagner again talking about this music we were just hearing. This goes on for a minute, but I'll read it. I love it. This, he says, is the fury of the world's dance. Fierce pleasure, agony, ecstasy of love, joy, anger, passion, and suffering, lightning flashes and thunder rolls, and above the tumult, the indomitable fiddler whirls us on to the abyss. Here's Wagner. A little dramatic, huh? <laughs> Well, it was not an opera. <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah. I love it. All right, 135. So I would say the most important thing for me to tell you about 135, for us to tell you, is you would think that Beethoven now, knowing the end is close, would do something momentous, something that would be bigger than anything he'd ever done. Instead, he does exactly the opposite. He goes for clearer textures, slower playing, actually kind of going back to his roots, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. More Haydn-esque, I think. Exactly. You go back. But, but he's been doing this all along. When he makes the Eroica Symphony, it's an enormous piece. And then the Fourth Symphony is sort of Haydn-esque. Then comes the Fifth Symphony, and the Sixth Symphony, the Seventh, they're all big pieces. Then comes the Eighth Symphony, which again is even earlier in Haydn. That sort of thing. He's given to going back. He is a man of many moods. And if he can't write them, he would have gone mad. So he always is changing these moods. And, and I also think one of the things that we forget about him is we love Beethoven from that first slide, you know, with the wild hair, shaking his fist at everybody. And this is sweet because I think in many ways, this quartet, especially when you listen to the opening of it, it's all about positive energy. It's all about, you know, whether Beethoven is going to survive his 52 years of life or not. He really believes that the future is bright and we can do well, we can do better than today. I think that's actually really appropriate for, for today. So let's hear that for next example, number eight, please. <laughs>
Charming is not a word we often use about Beethoven, but this is music of Charming. It's debonair. You know what it reminds me of in a way? It's Charlie Chaplin in a bow tie walking down the Champs Elysees. Also, what, what about the, the intervals? I mean, I'm always obsessed with intervals. There are fifths everywhere, one five, one five. I mean, it's not the kind of tight structure that we identify with late period Beethoven, but because he gives you all the thirds and the fifths, it feels like sunshine because there's all kinds of music in between these. And it's transparent. You can hear into the music. It's exactly amazing. What you're, I, but fun hanging out with this guy because we have so much of the same instincts when we're talking about music. We're starting to finish each other's senses. Guy, we got to watch this. Uh, it's fantastic. My wife really loves that. <laughs> Second movement is a scherzo with syncopated rhythms and very unusual keys. Kind of, we just talked about the predictability of the keys in the first movement. It's as if Beethoven says, I know that you knew what was coming. I'll make sure you don't know in this movement. Next example, please. <laughs> It's playful, but it always feels a little off balance, doesn't yeah. it? Like it could go completely out of control. Like imagine you're a waiter and you're coming down from the second floor carrying this huge tray of dishes which are clearing. And all of a sudden you feel your feet going out from under you. That's what this music sounds like to me. Oh! <laughs> and what about those repeated C's? Yeah. Dom, bomb. It's, it's almost like, I know you want me to go on, but I'm going to keep you there until I'm good and ready. So um, the third movement is a slow movement. And we'll talk about it in, in a second. It's marked lento cantando. So we'll talk about it in a second. Let's hear that example, please. And I love this movement. You know, it's in 6-8. It's incredibly slow. Is that the Amadeus Quartet again? Or? Yeah, um, this is actually the Emerson. Emerson. Yeah. But it's so beautiful the way they play. It's so slow. It goes, the tempo is one. It's in 6-8. It goes one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five. No hurry at all. It's an amazing, amazing calm. And it, it, it played so beautifully. May I impose on your perfect German to please read um, our big quote of the day there? Which is the one you're thinking about? The Süßer Ruchsenzeit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's beautiful. Süßer Ruhegesang. Ruhig is quiet. Gesang, you can figure out. So it's, it's a sweet song of quietness or of peace, freedom. So com to come back to what he marks, he says, cantando, and yet we are all four instruments in the lowest possible range. Right. The first and second violin is both on a G string. Yeah, the first violin starts on a D flat, which means a D flat just above middle C. The violin only goes down to G natural, so it's only got a diminished fifth below. There's not much room for the second violin below that. So all the instruments are in the lower register, but that's what adds to the sense of calm and peace. It's so beautiful. I also think this is Beethoven 
always using his imagination. Because you think cantando for a soprano instrument like violin will be somewhere above middle C. But here, because of that sense of calm and peace on earth, he actually puts it in a very low range. Now we know, for example, like Stravinsky, the opening of the Rite of Spring, he puts the bassoon at the highest possible range because he wants that stress. And here, you want the calmness of the lowest possible range, which also is amazing because of the gut strings. And we just heard, obviously, a modern setup for this quartet. Um, but the gut strings would be even more relaxed and would vibrate even slower. So it's really exciting um, and calm. Well, not exciting. It's, it's exciting for me to figure out why the registers are lower where you wouldn't expect them to be. So um, the next one is the last movement where we can talk about the intro. And um, this is actually more like the dramatic Beethoven. Let's hear that example, please. That's a question. We just heard. It's the question again. Does it have to be Musa's design? She writes those words in the score. Mus es sein. Does it have to be this way? Must it be this way? Must it be this way? And then comes the answer. The answer has to be heard live. Um, you, you look at that slide there on the right. Um, there's many different theories of what that means, and we yeah. discuss them. Yeah, but I mean, must it be, must it be, must it be? And then the answer comes, yeah, it's moose sign. Yeah, it's the way it is, Jack, get used to it. So one of the more popular theories is, well, after Beethoven is gone, what must it be? Is our world an empty place? And then there was another theory, which is kind of cute, so I want to share it with you. Yeah. Apparently one of his patrons um, was wondering about the Opus 135 Quartet, and he wanted it to be played. And Beethoven, very unapologetically, actually copied out the parts all by himself, did not use a copyist. And so they went to his house, and the servant says, well, you know, he's not seeing anybody, he's very sick. And um, he said, well, the, the patron says, well, would you give him a message? I'd like to play his quartet at my palace. And the servant goes to the Beethoven, and, and Beethoven says, absolutely, I'll be happy to lend you the parts, an original copy, for 50 florins. At which point the patron said, uh-uh, I'm just gonna wait and get it from the publisher another time. So Beethoven must have said, ah, if it must be, it must be. <laughs> so um, this is an incredible piece of music in, in the, the kind of timeless music that really, I, I would say it doesn't really bookend his career at all, does it? It, in some ways, looks philosophically onto the future when Beethoven knew he was no longer going to be around. Yeah, but I mean, what a positive thing. Yeah, it's Musa, it's going to be all right. It's the way it has to be. We have to adjust ourselves to see that what we have now on this earth is beautiful and joyous. So in the time we have left, let's listen to the last move, the finale of the Opus 130. Um, it's really a series of variations, very Mozartian. We were talking about it before. Let's hear that last example, please.
Yeah, it's Beethoven. He has to have a little drama. I, I love this excerpt because for a while there, it sounds like nobody knows what's going on. Like everybody's totally lost, and all of a sudden, magically, they all come together. And yet, it's, it's weightless music. It's not music that is pounding. It's weightless music. It's Mozartian. It, I think it's, it, it's a way for him to say, hey, at the end, I'm going back to my roots with Papa Haydn. So um, this last slide, I just wanted you kind of to look. This is Beethoven, the philosopher. And interestingly enough, he used to say that music is so much more powerful than philosophy. But here, he calls it the electrical soil in which the spirit lives. And this um, monument to, um, to Beethoven, which lives in Vienna. But this is about 60 years before Thomas Alva Edison came along. There was no electricity in Vienna in Beethoven's time. Talk Always about, ahead of his time. Talk about looking over the horizon. Yeah, for sure. So he died um, March 27th, 1827. But most importantly, he left us such an incredible legacy that I'm always amazed that here we are in the 21st century, and through this week, we heard, well, by the end of this concert, we will have heard all of the Beethoven 16, which was a five-year project for this organization. So I can't thank you, our audience, enough. Can't thank the board enough, and certainly Bill McLaughlin for being here. Thanks for inviting and me. Enjoying it's, been, us. it's been a ball this week, hasn't it? We're not going to forget this one. We heard, and this quartet keeps playing its batute off. They just play so intelligently and so passionately and so convincingly and so generously. It's been wonderful. But you know what? They couldn't do it without all of you. They're playing for you. They really are. I could tell. So thank you again for being here and enjoy this afternoon. <laughs>